Welcome to episode nine of the 99 Forever podcast. I'm Eric Friesen, and here to help me break down a 4-2 Oilers win in LA, as well as some other breaking news in oil country, is Shane Sanders. Shane, thanks for joining me. Hey, it's good to be back into the podcast world over here. Yeah, I know you've done a few podcasts with uh, Michael in the past, but I think this is the first time I've had you on, and I'm glad that we could uh, uh, do something tonight. Yeah, which is, it's odd to think that we haven't done a podcast podcast together because like we're, we talk pretty frequently on like Twitter. So I like, yeah. would have thought that we would have done something <laughs> together. You're one of my hockey writers too, right? Oh yeah, exactly. Like, I mean, you brought me onto the hockey writers, so I, I'll always appreciate you for that. And uh, like you said, you, you're one of my favorite people to talk Oilers hockey with. So it's a good night for us to <clears throat> talk about an Oilers win. And there's plenty of news going on around uh, the team right now. So it's a good night to do this. Yeah, it is. I think a good place to start and what I always like to do with my guests is just kind of find out a little bit about how they got first interested in hockey and became fans of the team. So why don't we just uh, begin there? Wh- when did you first take an interest in hockey and uh, start cheering for this team that we all love, the Edmonton Oilers? Oh, well, I was pretty much born into hockey. Uh, I think I was on skates as soon as I could walk. I think that was uh, so pretty much. I grew up in the hockey was pretty much all I really knew. I remember the earliest thing that I really remember was the uh, was that Canadians '93 run to the final when they went up against LA, and I was kind of torn because I liked I liked the Kings at the time, but that was the first team that I really kind of been exposed to. And then that magical run with the Habs that year, where they won like 11 overtime games or whatever in a row. Um, but that was a, that was probably the earliest memory that I have, and then I remember the uh, the '94 run for the Canucks. That was the year after, and you know, I'm in the Vancouver area, so that one was one that was you know gripping through the province newspaper every uh, every week. And here's your new here's your Yuki Lume poster that comes out of the newspaper <laughs> the week after. You've got uh, you know your Nathan Lafayette poster. You're collecting them all and putting them all aside so that you know those are the early memories that i have from the sport and then you know having my first fight in tyke because some kid ran across the red line and stole the puck from our side so i just you know i was growing up on rock'em sock'em and scott stevens so (laughs) are you a big guy (laughs) no not really no i'm uh, okay i'm about like no i'm not i'm not that big of a guy i'm a pretty small guy i'm like 5 10 about 200 pounds so oh well you're solid built though yeah, like an oak tree, but <laughs> you're like uh, you, you kind of got the Ethan Bear uh, body then. Yeah, kind of. Okay, yeah. well that's good. If you were a right shot defenseman, you might have made it. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> I'd get buried on the depth chart really fast. <laughs> so you you've lived in BC your entire life then. Whole life, yeah. So how did you gravitate towards the Oilers? Uh, well, I guess I was a little bit of a traitor. Um, okay. So. The 94 run happens, you know, and like, you know, now we're exposed to the Canucks and like, this is the team kind of going up. And I was about like five or so at the time. And anyways, the years come on, the Canucks get the new arena there, GM plays. And, you know, everything's going big around the Canucks. Everybody's real big Canuck fans. And then all of a sudden they, you know, the wheels fell off the bus there. They traded a Linden. And, you know, I think the, the thing that kind of hurt me the most was when they traded Burray because Burray was the identity along with Linden of just like, that's the superstar. Linden was the heart and soul of that team. But, you know, when the, once they lost that superstar with Burray, I was like, I'm done. I'm, I remember being in the backyard of my house and we were playing shooter targets when the trade was, we wrote, we, the trade got broken on, uh, on the radio there. And I was like, I will never cheer for the Canucks again. That's what I said to my parents. And I was, oh, wow. <laughs> and they were like, all right, oh, easy there, buddy. And then, uh, you know, just around that time, though, it was uh, the Oilers were just starting to come up and become something, you know. They had Cujo at the time. They had Doug Wade, Ryan Smith, uh, Bill Guerin coming around, you know, Yanni Ninema, just that young group with, like, Boris Miranov. You know, they were going up against Dallas and going through all those wars. But, uh you know, I think it was that series against Dallas really is kind of the pinpoint of it, really, where uh, you see that seven-game series with Marshawn scoring that, uh, you know, Dallas comes down one way, Kujo makes an incredible save, puck in transition, Marshawn on that breakaway, buries it in game seven. And I think after that, I was hooked. 
It's funny because as you're describing that play, I can just visualize it in my head. I think if you talk to a lot of Oilers fans who watched that goal, like it's it's just permanently etched in their mind. Yeah, it's one of the one of the few good memories that you know the the generation of Oiler fans that's of, of my age. You know, that's that's kind of like the the launching point for a lot of us was mm-hmm. that big run to that big run that they had there that year. But there hasn't been a whole lot of good stuff, right? So no. that's why moments like that last. And that was my first year of playing minor hockey, and the first year that I really followed the NHL. So. That 97 playoff run really sticks out in my mind. And uh, yeah, I was eight years old at the time. So that was probably probably the first big hockey memory that I have. And mm-hmm. yeah, I, I think a lot of Oilers fans will always appreciate Todd Marchand. Uh, did you go to many Canucks games growing up, though, or when the Oilers were in town or just any games in general? Uh, I went to a lot of Canuck games just kind of, you know, like sporadically whenever they get uh, sprinkled in. Uh, but lately, since the... The the main thing though is uh, I think after I've gone to almost every Oilers game since they've been here since 2010, but since uh, Connor has been here, I've been to every single uh, Oilers game since 2015, and I I missed one, and the one I missed was because I had a scheduled shift, and it was right around it was that December 23rd one, and it was just around Christmas time, so I couldn't just like call in sick to work and stuff like that so that was the only game that i've missed since uh, mcdavid era has launched right that was the, just before christmas this year i think they yeah. they lost to the canucks narrowly four four two or something if my memory is correct yeah i think they they lost that one but one they won before so yeah. yeah they won they won earlier in the month uh i remember leon dreisaitl scored a nice power play goal on a cross ice pass from mcdavid in the third period so it's, it's weird how those games stick out in your mind but uh uh, I think because the Canucks are such a big rival, it's just always sweet every time they they beat them. Uh, during the 2011 uh, Cup run, did any part of you say, you know, I'd love to see my hometown team win it, or were you still pretty anti-Canucks at that point? You know, you know, I think uh, that that 2011, it was that 2010 and that 2011 run is the, those two years back to back. You know, everybody kind of just. It didn't really matter what your primary team was, but for the Canucks, those two years, like that's that was the time that we felt that they were at their peak. You know, you had the Sedins on one line, you had Kessler and Burroughs that were also there, and like that was like your core group and just the depth of that team. That was probably one of the deepest Canuck teams that we've ever seen, and you know everybody kind of hopped back under the the Canuck bandwagon just for a little bit. Just for just to kind of go through that run, you know, mm-hmm. you lose to you lose to the Hawks in six the year in 2010, and then that was the year that the Hawks end up going to the final, and so you know you're just kind of right there. And then the year after that, that 2011 run is just like, I think there's a lot of people here that will still have fond memories of the of that run and just everything that happened to it. Like I remember like being downtown for for the games you're watching them on the big score the outside the cbc complex and you know unfortunately i remember we we're at that game seven outside the cbc complex and it was just there were way too many people that were there and you know you could just kind of start to see in the crowd that there were ple- there were people that were planning to riot before the event had even gone up oh, like, wow. even, like people that were just not even canuck fans that were just there wanting to cause trouble because they knew that they could probably get away with it like we had a girl that was in our high school that ended up getting kicked uh, that she got kicked out of her university she was on like a decent scholarship and she got she got booted from her university was in the news and stuff like that but i remember being there just as it was starting and we're like yeah i turned to my buddy i was like we gotta get out of here and so (laughs) we ended up just kind of taking the taking a long way out of town and like as you're seeing you know we we were walking out just as the first car is flipped and we're like oh man this is gonna be bad but i remember they had to they shut down the entire downtown core they were only they were allowing people out but they weren't Mm -hmm. allowing people into the downtown and then just all like the police forces like the ambulance services that were on that night i i run into a lot of those guys and they they were stuck in that downtown area and just like on 
extension of their own shifts, just staying there, just working extra because of the riots. And, you know, they, there's only so much that they could really do. And just the, the damage to the city that night was just like unreal. Like I haven't seen anything like that since maybe like the, there was, a, there was, a, there's another riot in 94 when they went to the final, but this was, uh, you know, I don't really remember much of the 94 one, but this 2010, 2011 one was bad. And so that's kind of like the one thing that kind of stays with you. But with that 2011 run, you know, that, that whole, the riot aside, like, you know, you just saw like the Canucks, they were just so close and you, you kind of watch the ebbs and flows of that final series versus Boston. And it's just, you know, if you get a bounce here, you get a bounce there or a bounce there, you know, things are a little bit different, but the Bruins had that mentality where they were with like Lucic, where if you poke the bear a little bit, the whole team yeah. woke up and said so there was that Andrew Alberts hit where I think it was Andrew Alberts when he smoked uh, Horton and that was in like game three. And then after that, like Bruins couldn't like the Canucks couldn't hold a candle with the Bruins after that. So, and I think there's a lot of Oilers fans who are still pretty happy with the way that that series ultimately turned out. And, uh, I mean, watching Lucic play in that playoffs, I mean, if the Oilers would have been able to get that Lucic in 2016, he'd probably still be on his team today and being an effective member of a playoff run right now. Oh, yeah. Like, you know, Lucic grew up, you know, I remember watching him here when he played for the Giants in the WHL. And, you know, he was he was a decent guy that could get moving. He could, you know, it was one of those things, even in junior, though, you notice, that, like, if you, if you just stayed away from him, and just let him be. He would just kind of be there, you know, and just he wouldn't engage as much. But he was Lucic at his best. He was he was when he was moving his feet and actually getting involved in the plays. But you know, as he's gotten older here, it's just the wheels just aren't really there, right? So I think for that's sure. been a huge thing for him. And you know, for me, whenever there's a kid from Saskatchewan who makes it onto the Oilers, it's always kind of cool. I lo- I love you know Jordan Eberle and now Ethan Bear. It's just kind of I like to see a guy from my own province uh, be a valuable member of the Oilers. Is it sort of the same for you with guys like Ryan Nugent Hopkins and Jujar Carey? Do you kind of get a bit of a kick out of watching those guys uh, make it to the NHL and play for your favorite team? I think it's nice to see, you know, like, uh, like Nuge grew up playing in like uh, for Burnby winter club, which is just one of the organizations that I would end up playing with. I never ended up, I never played against him, but, but uh but I remember, like, you know, he, you know, all these guys are just in this area all together. Like, Kara is from Surrey. Like, you know, it's kind of interesting to watch these guys all just slowly just evolve and then make their way into the NHL. So, happy for them. Um, but, yeah, you know, whether they're playing for the Oilers or anywhere else, you know, like, I think it, the whole Jujar Kara is, you know, as being like a, uh, like, being one of the first. Punjabi MB, uh, NHL players in the league, mm-hmm. you know, that, that's big for the culture down here, right? Like there's a lot of East Indian kids that are now getting into sports and at least they have someone that they can pinpoint on and say, Hey, oh, like, absolutely. You know, Kara plays here. Right. So it's going to, it's good for getting kids into the sport and it's good for just having them have someone of their own descent, make it to the league. Cause then they say, Hey, if Jujar made it, then we can probably make it too. So it gets more kids involved and, want to go on right are you noticing that there is quite a bit of diversity playing minor hockey now in the vancouver bc area oh yeah like it was i think my age was uh was when i started to notice like going playing through the 90s and uh, in the early 2000s that's when the huge diversity of it was just booming right and so now you've got a lot of people now that are putting their kids into hockey that are second generation or third generation uh, Canadians that have moved over here from India, you know, like, I think I, like I was, uh, my grandparents moved here first and then my dad started playing and my uncle and whatnot. And then my, the next generation after that was me and my cousins. And so, you know, it's just, even with us, like we're a hockey family and we've fully like gone into the sport over here and we're all still involved in varying levels, whether it's coaching or, uh, development camps and um, you know uh, my cousins was trying to get into college hockey or whatnot as well so uh, I, I think it's good for the sport you know we, we've got to get some more drafted uh, some more kids drafted into the league yeah. but 
you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get there eventually. <laughs> of course. I mean, it's it's only going to grow with time. I think, was, was Jujar the third player of Punjabi descent to make it to the NHL, I think? Uh, I believe he was the fourth. Uh, okay. Because uh, I remember Robin Bow was yeah. like one of the first. So it was like... Um, it was Manny Robin Malhotra? Bawa. Manny Malhotra, yeah. He was half. And uh, there was another guy as well. I just don't remember what his name was, but I don't know if he actually played in the NHL. But it was, um, yeah, it was Kara might be the third, but I believe he might be the fourth. He's got a brother too that was playing in junior. He played brother, junior, right? Yeah. Yeah, and his brother, his brother Seva, he uh, he did go to an Oilers uh, rookie development camp. Uh, two, I believe it was two years ago, and he was uh, he was there in the rookie camp. I don't think he made it. He never made it to main camp, but he was there in rookie camp a few years ago. Um, but there was a, like there's some have been some other ones too like uh, Prab Rai was a kid that played for Seattle in the WHL and uh, he was a Canucks like fifth round pick uh, you know like well, it's got to be like 10 15 years ago now but uh, Prab Rai was a pick he went through the whole process but then he uh, he ended up going to got a really bad accident actually like fractured his spine and you know, oh, that no. was the end of his career but uh, you know. But uh, that was all. Like you know, there's been some, there's been some guys coming along. Jujar is kind of the the one right now that's actually playing, right? So, but um, well, we'll, there's probably going to be a couple more East Indian guys coming through the league. You won't see, you won't see it be like you know like the fourth or fifth. You're going to start seeing in the next ten years. You're going to start seeing that number yeah. like double, triple, right? So. No, that's awesome. I, it's any way we can grow the game in any parts of the world and with different cultures it's awesome i think eventually the nhl wants to grow in china too i mean it only makes yeah. sense with a country that big that they should have a chinese presence in the nhl even in germany we've seen um more high-end prospects come in after dry cycle. that country is really starting to take off so there's a uh, the, the, you know the the game of hockey is growing in different parts of the world and it's awesome to see and i'm glad you mentioned the rookie tournament because you made me think of something uh it was recently announced that the oilers are going back to the canucks young star tournament that they host in penticton uh what do you think about that development that the oilers will be going back to participate i think it's perfect it's just, it's what they need out here like uh it's really good for penticton as well being like a you know, a community that just kind of booms in the summer as it is. And so giving them another attraction for the summer will, will drive some more people towards the interior in that Okanagan area. Some great wineries over there, too. So, uh, you know, it, it's it's good. Like, we, we need to get the, the Canucks, the Flames, the Oilers, and, you know, maybe even the Jets back and just get them all together. And I think those are the teams all. that are there. Yeah, because they did that a few years ago, and then I don't know why it just kind of fizzled out. There was some, uh, there was some poor stuff in trying to get things organized and how things were going to get done, and so it kind of fell apart. But now I'm glad to see that it's coming back together, though. Yeah, it, it wasn't the Jets originally in that tournament, was it? The Sharks. I'm trying to remember who else was in that. Yeah, tournament. it was but... um, before the Sharks. Before the Jets came in, it was the Sharks. Yeah, I figured that it would be one of the northern. California teams it makes sense that they're pretty close in proximity so yeah I think that's awesome that they're going to go back and you know hopefully the Oilers will have a, a decent group of prospects there with you know guys like Broberg and Lavoie I don't, I don't know if Broberg will be able to come because uh, the Swedish season might be underway unless he ultimately decides to go to Bakersfield next season yeah I think that's the, that's the the word is that Broberg might be coming over next year right I think we'll get a decision by rookie camp but uh, on, on where he's going to come next year, but uh, it, I kind of fifty fifty on whatever he does. But um, I think that the uh, the Oilers kind of want to get him over to North America as soon as they can. But yeah, um, you know, well, whatever ends up happening is what ends up happening with him. I mean, I I don't mind that he wanted to stay in Sweden an extra year this year instead of playing in Hamilton in the OHL, but. Uh, they're going to have a benefit of letting his entry level contract slide next year because he'll still just be 19. So you might as well take advantage of that, get him used to the system, and then bring him up the next year. And, and they're getting the same deal with Bouchard being on that uh, yep. that slide contract. So you got a couple young defensemen there who have bright futures, and that can only bode well for the Oilers. Yeah, exactly. It's all about how many pro, how many games you play in the NHL, right? So yeah. Uh, I'd like to see Broberg come over here um, just because of the fact that now we're we're going through a phase where 
I don't think anybody was expecting this many kids from Bakersfield to be coming up as quickly as they are and be pushing for a minute. It's crazy. Uh, like, yeah. When was the last time the Oilers had a second wave of talent come up from the farm team and be part of a big playoff run? I mean, this is maybe the early 2000s was the last time. Yeah, it was that uh, the group of like Stahl, Horkoff, and you know the, that group that kind of came together with Torres and whatnot, right? Yeah. That group all coming together was kind of just the one influx of talent that they had. But you, there's what like Jones was there. Uh, Jones was uh, in the minors this year at one point. Bear was. Uh, was He's been with the team the Vegas whole time. Field. Yeah, so like Jones and Bear for guys that were there last year. Yeah. And then you got Benson, you got Yamamoto, and that's that's the four real guys that were that were down last year that we were like, oh, maybe like one or two of them might squeak up. Like I don't like I think Bear was the guy that really surprised everybody off the start. Like. People were expecting him to push for a roster spot, but I don't think they were expecting him to be this good this soon. No, I I mean, he really blossomed early. I think that his first half of the season was better than his, the second half has been so far, but Mm -hmm. that's a, he was the team's rookie of the year until Yamamoto burst on the scene with 21 points in 21 games and kind of took that title away from him. But you know who else is having a sneaky good year is Caleb Jones. Like he's, I mean, he had, he had two points again tonight, two assists. And uh, I, it's like we said, the Oilers have a a new influx of talent. That's really helping them. Yeah. And the, and the thing that I really like about Jones is him and bear have been able to do something. It's just like when they get the puck, they just, you know, Bear would just take that extra second to just take a look. Like he's not afraid to 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 take a step back with the puck to make two steps forward kind of thing. Like he's always looking to just kind of get the puck up, make a safe play, but just to kind of always looking to advance the puck off the ice and not and you know, it's one of those things where sometimes we look at nurse and say like some of the decision making isn't that great. But like even then you look at Caleb Jones and like he just makes a lot of nice safe plays and he's always just kinda of in the right position. Uh, in his in his own zone to just limit those scoring opportunities. So I I really like the two uh, I really like the two of them coming in this year and just how they've played so far. Right. So they're given they're not only just two young defensemen coming in, but they're becoming two of the Oilers' more reliable defensemen. Right. So it's seeing that top six or that top six group of defensemen finally start rounding in, and you know you're not really having a whole lot of guys that are you know oh crap we got to play like. You know, who we got to play fair and so like our top defensemen, like we're past that era now, right? So, uh, you've got a group of six right now where they can all manage, they can all get a decent, you know, helping of minutes right now, and they all can all play those. Absolutely. And it's just, it's great to see these guys really contributing in a meaningful way. They're not just joining a, a weak team that's going to be in the lottery. This is a playoff team, and they're, they're valuable parts of it. So, that's, that's even better. And uh, the one thing I, I wanted to last ask you about yourself before we dive into more Oilers talk, I know we've been jumping all over the place, but uh, uh, you mentioned Burray, one of your favorites uh, as a young kid. A uh, couple of your favorite Oilers growing up who uh, you really loved watching? Oh, um, you know, this is, uh, it might be sacrilegious to say, but actually like when I was playing growing up and uh Going through my minor hockey career, Jerome McGinley was my favorite player, even though he played for the Flames. But. I think a lot of people respect him, though. He's probably, I, I don't have many favorite Flames, but I would have to say that he's the Flame that I respect the most. I think he's everybody's favorite. I think you're allowed to have a pass because it's Jerome McGinley. Like, I remember, like, I think that mo- almost every kid that was playing in my age group. You know, they'd come down, they'd do the, they'd try to mimic that down the wing, you pump your leg and you've got that pump shot, like that Joe McGillan pump shot, like, yeah, that was beauty. But, um, you know, Oilers' favorite kind of growing up and going through this, you know, I, I, I like Doug Waite, um, or, you know, Ryan Smith's a, a That's key an easy one, one for most well, people, right? I think, yeah. You know, uh, but... And I always kind of had a thing for Tommy Salo, even though he was, okay. you know, his goaltending was just kind of, you know, suspect sometimes. But uh, I like Tommy a- Salo. I thought he was a really underrated goalie. I think he was on the verge of becoming a top-notch goalie in the early 2000s. N- never quite got there, but he was good. Mm-hmm. He was right on the cusp, you know, like he was just kind of there. But, you know, I-, I think that if 
things are done differently for Sweden at that uh, 2002 Olympics. You would have seen his stock. It, it killed his it killed his confidence. But right there, like just before that, in 01, 02, he was one of the reasons why the Oilers were sneaking into the playoffs every year mm-hmm. because of his stellar goaltending. Yeah, and you have to remember he came in and had to replace Curtis Joseph. So it's not like uh, there was like. Uh, a bit of a sieve behind him. Like this is an all time great goalie that the Oilers had. And <clears throat> he's coming in to replace him as the Oilers number one goalie. That's a, that's a tough job mm-hmm. to take, but he did a good job of making fans forget about Cujo in my opinion. Yeah. You know, you look you kind of come back now after all these years, you kind of look fondly. Um, always like the, like some of the more obscure guys, like you kind of coming through, like I think the guy with the coolest name when I was a, uh, kind of like a younger Oilers fan, was Sven Butenschon. Remember yeah, that guy? <laughs> I do. German defenseman that played like, what, is it half a season he was done? <laughs> well, it's it, sometimes there's a player who you just have an attachment to and that you're yeah. a big fan of. You know who was one for me when I was in grade six, seven, eight was... uh Please say Walking Co- Gauge. No, no, <laughs> not Walking Gauge, but, uh, you know, good for him that he uh, had carved out a bit of an NHL career for himself. But uh, Anson Carter. I was I was a big Anson Carter fan in the early 2000s, and I remember he was traded at the trade deadline in 2003, which is crazy to say was 17 years ago. But yeah. I remember I was I was a little bit crushed when I came home from school at lunch hour. I only live a block away, so I rushed home to turn on the t- TV and see what Sportsnet had. And when I saw that he was traded, I believe for Radic Dvorak. Uh, yeah. I I was uh, I was a little frustrated that they got rid of him, and, and Dvorak was a decent player too. But man, that 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 one kind of hurt me a little bit. And 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 he was another guy who had to replace a uh, a star player. Uh, he came in in the Bill Guerin trade, if you remember, from Boston. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, it was uh, a lot of these guys. Uh, it, the the Oilers were trading a, away, and that was like a weird trade too, because wasn't that the uh... No, that was the trade from before, uh, where uh, what you call it? Where was it? Yeah, because he wasn't he. Because where did he get drafted by? Was he, he was he was, he was Washington drafted by? Pick, remember, he, yeah. No, so no, he was this, he was drafted by Quebec City, and then he never played for them. He went to Washington. Yeah. So his first team was Washington. Yeah. And then he was a part of like this weird trade that was like him. Um, was it like Jason Allison was in it? Jim Carrey was in it. Like Bill Ranford and like who, who else was the other? I think Adam Oates was in that too. Yeah. Now that you're talking about it, I I remember it more. I I wouldn't have remembered it off the top yeah, of my head was, the way you did. That was that was the deal that uh, that they did at the at the '97 deadline. So before that, that was the one where the Caps went made that uh, run to the final. Remember? Yeah. Whereas Detroit. But yeah, that was a weird one where they, I think it was uh, Oates, Ranford as the backup behind Colzig, and then Talkett as like a, 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 a as a two depth forwards on that one that were playing the middle six or whatever. So I'm just for, pulling uh, up his hockey DB page right now. He was drafted in the tenth round in the '92 draft by Quebec City, so 220th overall. He debuted in '97. Played just 19 games with the Capitals that year before being traded to the Bruins at the deadline. Yeah. And then he was there for parts of four seasons before he came to Edmonton. But, uh, you know, he had a good good little career for himself. Played 674 games in the league, scored over 200 goals. Had that one great year with the Sedins that I'm sure you yeah. remember. Yeah, that, he scored like 30 goals with the Sedins. But, you know, they. I remember when he was... Uh, because uh, he was there for like one year and he was a UFA after, I believe. And so the Canucks wanted to re-sign him, but they wanted to do it on the cheap. But he was yeah. he was wanting to get a big payday for it. And so they just let him walk and they're like, all right, well, we are we know why you're getting the goals this year. <laughs> it's not because all of a sudden you've just found this magical box. It's because of who you're playing with. We like that yeah. you compliment them, but you know we're not going to pay you this exorbitant amount of salary that you're expecting and so what did he end up in Columbus and just fizzled out so you yeah. know. he looked good with Ryan Smith and Mike Comrie back in the early 2000s as well i i like that line yeah that was a good line <clears throat> and then i believe he actually got brought to Oilers training camp on a PTO in like 08 and didn't end up making the team but that, i i was kind of secretly hoping that he would 
get a, another deal and get to come back to yeah, the Oilers. I think that, yeah, so that was uh, that was 2007. So that would have okay. been that would have been for the 0708 season because he had just finished up with uh, he had just finished up with uh, Columbus and you know he played a little bit with Carolina at the end of the year and then he was waiting for a job and then he didn't get one and so he went over and played in the Swiss League after I don't think he made the Oilers didn't make much of an impact in training camp and ended up uh, make, I pull it, let me pull it up here right now. Um, I'd so love for the Oilers to bring played. these guys back more too. For like, you remember they used to do those once an Oiler, always an Oiler nights for, oh, yeah. for guys like guys who weren't going to get their jersey retired, but it's just a nice kind of night to give them a tip of the cap. He he'd be one of the guys I'd love for them to do that for. Well, I think one thing that they need to do in Edmonton is um, so at Rogers Arena in Vancouver here, there's the guys that get the numbers retired. And then the guys that are just on the cusp but were like really good players for the team that will they won't get their numbers retired, but you know, they want to honor the player. They have a ring yeah. of honor that goes across the top. So like that's where you've got guys like, you know, Kirk McLean's up there, um, what you call it? Pat Quinn's up there, uh Matthias Olin uh, is up there as well, right? And like Curtin Box up See, there. Uh... So it'd be it's nice a, to get the Oilers something to do something like that in, in uh, Rogers or Rogers it's, place. It's a cool idea, and I remember seeing that on Twitter recently. Some people talking about that. The only thing is, I don't want Ryan Smith on a Ring of Honor. I I will stand up for him till the end of time that his jersey should be retired, whether or not he's in the Hall of Fame. I think that that doesn't necessarily have to be the criteria to have your your jersey retired by a team. I mean, they're they'll say you have to win cups. You have to have your Jersey retired. Well, there are lots of teams who don't have cups and have jerseys retired. So I don't know where you fall on the Ryan Smith thing, but for me, he's, he's absolutely deserves it. I'd like to see him in the hall of fame. Like this guy's won what? Like, Oh, I'm just saying for the, the hall of fame. I'm not sure he'll get it. I hope he gets, I'm saying to get his Jersey retired. Uh, If he gets into the hall of fame, that's even a that's, huge I think that's the thing, right? Is that they want them to be Hall of Famers. Yeah. But you look at the Canucks, though, too. Is like, like you know, there was an argument the other day where I think it was Saravelli was the writer that said that uh, the Sedins aren't guaranteed to be uh, first ballot Hall of Famers or even Hall of Famers at all, mm-hmm. based on their, based on what they've done. But you look at well, like you know, scoring I, titles, I think, Stanley I Cup final. I think you know, that they'll get in because you know they, they won those Art Rosses. They they won a Lindsay. They won. A heart trophy right so i think that they'll eventually get in but uh you know you you look at ryan smith it's, it's not just your what you did in the nhl you know exactly. he was the he was the embodiment of the oilers for the 90s and the early 2000s before he was traded yeah. but yeah you, know, you look at his inner his international resume too though right like you he, he represented canada for for the better part of like two decades yeah but he was a staple most ever games for Team Canada, I believe, on the international yeah. stage. Like he's I mean, won this a, is the guy. he's won a gold at the juniors. He's won gold at the Olympics. He's won a World Cup. He's won two World Championships. Olympic like, gold. Ba- yeah, uh, yeah. I said they. Oh, uh, Olympic gold. Yeah, yeah two thousand two. Juniors, and... the Olympics. He's won a World Junior, and he's won two World Championships. Like based on the uh, on his international resume alone, and what he's done for Canada, like that's that's enough to warrant consideration because like, you know, like uh, you, you got some of the guys that were playing for Russia that did nothing in the NHL exactly. but because of their international resume, they got it. And so I think the the argument is valid for Ryan Smith. They warrant consideration. And I'm glad that he got into the w, double IHF hall of fame. And that's a step in the right direction. I think yep. it's like you said, it's not the NHL hall of fame. It is the hockey hall of fame. And, I mean, really, he scored 386 goals in the NHL. If not for some injuries, he easily gets 400, might have got closer to 450 even. So if he ends up in somewhere between 400 to 450 goals and the Oilers win game seven in 06, now he's got a cup ring, he's got Olympic gold medal, and he's got, we'll just say, 430 goals. I mean, does, does that get you into the Hall of Fame? I mean, I think it does. I think it should. So we saying... That if he if he was healthier, and if they win one game, if they if they win game seven in 06, that Ryan Smith's a shoe in for the Hall of Fame. I would. I'd he oh. he'd be a, he'd be on my ballot for sure. 
Well, I guess we've heard it here first. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, if only uh, Lanny McDonald and whoever else is on the selection committee can get on board with it, then we'll be able to get that done. But uh, no, he's uh, he's an Oilers legend. I think some people will say because he was never a quote unquote elite player in the league mm-hmm. that that he shouldn't get that honor. But I think he should be in. I think he was still, you know, you could say that he wasn't an elite, but he was still a premier player, right? Yeah. Like, you, you've got a guy that was playing on a lot of really crappy Oilers teams. Like, in the, like even those uh, those teams that were in the 2000s, you know, he didn't really have much to work with, really. Like, they, even when they had Horkoff, like, was Horkoff really a bona fide, like, first line player? No, no like, like, they had the one year where it was, I mean, the year they went to the final, it was him... It was Horikov, Hemsky, and Smith. Yep. And I believe they had... Hemsky had 77 points, Horikov 73, which was the outlier year for him. And yeah. Smith was Smith was mid-60s, I want to say 66, 67. Yeah. But he was the goal scorer on the line. He had like yeah, 36, had 36 goals, that year. goals that year. Yeah. yeah. See, it's funny how we just both have it in our head. But <laughs> uh, but yeah, it was... I mean, that was a great line. And then they... they filled in with some depth, probably the best depth that they'd had since the late nineties with that. Oh, six team. The best center that he had was Doug Wade. And then Easily. You know, obviously it didn't last that long, but it would have been nice to have seen Doug Wade stick around. Cause yeah. I, think that, I think if he had like a premier guy like Doug Wade for a little bit longer, when he was actually in like the, the true prime of his career, I think you would have seen some way better numbers from Smith. You would have seen some 40 goal seasons from them. And and that's exactly it. When he did hit his prime, he was the best player on the team. And I think that Smith Smith is a guy who you want to be like your second best, third best maybe guy on the team. And the fact that he was having to carry the offensive load without a playmaker to set him up, that probably did hurt his numbers a little bit. Yeah. But anyway, we'll shift more towards the current state of the team. Um it's great. I mean, I, I could probably talk for two hours with you just about 90s and 2000s Oilers. But uh, <laughs> we had a win tonight on the West Coast. The Oilers picked up a big 4-2 win in Connor McDavid's return. Just wanted to get some quick thoughts from you on the game tonight. You know, um, so tonight's game, I didn't really watch it too close. Uh, okay. But, uh, you know, the the things that I did, pay, did pick up, because more like, Usually when I'm watching an Oilers game, I'm just kind of I kind of hunker down by myself and just kind of just zone into the TV. And I'm just watching every little nook and cranny of what's going on. Uh, tonight, not so much, but uh, you know, it, it was nice to see McDavid come back, um, and especially to have an impact right away. Uh, you you see that goal where it's just the give and go with uh, with Drysaddle. You know, that's just a classic between them is we're, we're getting actually spoiled because we're seeing that almost every game now, whereas this McDavid and Dry side, even though they're on two, they're anchoring two separate lines, but you get them together on the power play is McDavid to Dry Sidle, Here we go. And how many times yeah. do we see that every game? Right. And so they, they connect and that was a beautiful goal by Dry Sidle. And then you see Connor later on, you know, I, that was, I think everybody thought that that was a hooking call by uh by Dowdy. Oh. I think you saw like in it was almost like in three in three consecutive shifts after that he tries the same move three times and then by the third time he uh that was the one where McDavid got the goal on Peterson yeah. but uh you know you look he, he did the same, he did the same move three times and you know he he fooled everybody right um and then Nugent Hopkins so you got a goal from each of the three big three guys right and that's what that's what this team needs uh your goaltending, you know, Smith and Koskinen aren't world beaters. I don't think anybody expects them to be, and I don't think anybody's expecting top 10 goaltending from them. But, you know, they give you just enough to keep you in the game. That's all you can ask, right? This team's a lot better defensively than they've been in years. This is probably the best this team's looked defensively since that. I'd probably say that it's probably better than that 16-17 run when they were in the playoffs. But uh, yeah. It's 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 depth. Like it was like going back to what we were talking about earlier. Like you know you you had in that sixteen seventeen group. You know you had like you know Griffin Reiner coming up for a little bit, but you you know you had these young defensemen that just maybe just weren't as ready for some of the roles, and your your depth guys weren't weren't really there. But this year, you know, you've got a strong depth group. Like you've got Jones coming in to play valuable minutes. Bears walked right in and stabilized that pairing with uh 
with Nurse on most nights. And, you know, he's got a reliable guy to play with now. And, you know, I know that Larson gets, um, you know, a lot of flack out here. But, you know, on most nights, you know what you're getting from him. Like, he might not be the offensive guy that you're expecting. But, you know, for for a guy that's going to be like, you know, and realistically, like, if he was getting paid appropriately for it, you know, he'd be like a number four defenseman. And he gives you what you'd expect every night. He's a shutdown guy. He's able to play on your PK. He plays hard every night and he makes things difficult in the defensive zone for the, the opposition, right? Once this group gets healthy and you've got, you know, you've got Clefbaum back, you've got Larson and then Jones and Bear keep continuing to take that evolution. Uh, this defense pair, this defense group right now is just going to continue to blossom. We haven't even talked about introducing Broberg. We haven't even gotten into, you know, Bouchard, potentially making a spot on the team next year and we haven't even talked about the the fact that they just made a trade today for Mike Green that's it I, I wanted to get to that a little later in, in the podcast but I'm glad yeah. you brought that up because that was the other breaking news that we did have to discuss um, but uh, yeah w- this was a game they had to get tonight and uh, I was saying to my dad while watching the game we were watching it together that you know they, they just can't get a, a call to save their lives I mean it took until late in the third period for them to get a full two minute power play. They scored on a, a short power play that was in the first period coming off four on four, but they just, with all that entire game and the stuff that got away, I couldn't believe that it took that long for the ref to finally put his arm up. And it's just ridiculous. The calls, I, I feel like we're just beating a dead horse here, but it's true. I mean, look at how frustrated Connor was with the refs. He never, gets that upset unless it's something really egregious and tonight it was and and he was he was frustrated and you saw Doughty laughing on the bench and it reminds me of a game earlier in the year when uh Doughty kind of got his uh his glove up in Connor's face and was laughing about it after too it's just one of those things where he he's kind of trying to get in his head but I guess Connor did get the last laugh with the goal still uh I mean what do you think with all these calls are the refs ever going to start to maybe call a few extra penalties on McDavid or is it just never going to come? You know, you, you'd hope that they would because I think it's getting to the point where he's kind of earned some, he's earned some credit, he's earned some respect. But, you know, I think the refs are expecting him to just be played hard. You know, but everybody's just going to be playing him hard. Um, but I think the frustration that we, that we as fans get when we watch these games, is it's, it's no different than what a lot of Canucks fans feel when, Pedersen just suffers abuse after abuse. Like this guy gets like two handed across the back. He gets two hands across the back of the leg. You know, he gets tripped up. Guys are knocking or like punching him in the head. He's getting the Sedin treatment that, uh, you know, Daniel and Henrik used to get. And, you know, the, he's not getting any calls either. So it's, I, I, I don't think it's just Connor, but it's, uh, it's oh, across no. the league. I mean, a lot of these star guys that should be, you know, the, the abuse that they go through is, you know, you want to protect your stars, and yeah, you know, if if you're going to be going through and and hooking these guys and jabbing these guys and going all over and just cutting into the space that they have, like you know, there should be some more calls onto what's going on here. Absolutely, and look, I'm not a Goudreau fan, I'm not a Pedersen fan, I'm not a Matthews fan, and look, they're all fantastic players. It's just that because they play for teams that I don't like, it's it's hard for me to really appreciate them but when i do watch petterson and i try to take it from a neutral perspective i i do think that he is a fantastic hockey player and he's probably going to become a hundred point player in this league i was literally uh, just about to say that i was like, yeah, you know, like just give it another year or two like that guy is going to be a hundred point guy he's going to be the, like the one of the biggest stars in the league yeah he's absolutely elite I, I think he's already packed on a little bit of muscle it'll help him to add even a little more but this this kid is uh, well. That was the big thing is that fantastic. they wanted him to do. That was the big yeah. thing they wanted him to do in the off season. So he saw a, like a strength and conditioning coach. They overhauled his plans just uh, because you know at one sixty what he was last year, you know it just was not durable enough for the NHL. No, I mean up until a few years ago, I was six foot one, one hundred and sixty pounds. So uh, I mean. I, I never thought of myself of having an NHL frame. So to think that he was playing in the league at that and, and Nugent Hopkins was pretty close to that too, when he first started. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's, it, it's tough to go through the rigors of an 82 game season 
when you're you know you're that slight. But um, yeah, I know you probably watch him a lot closer than a lot of Oilers fans because you probably see more Canucks games. But um, yeah, it's it's tough. I think the worst thing that I've seen happen to him was in Florida. Was it in Florida where he got tackled to the ice? He basically got like WWE like <laughs> power bombed. Uh, Petter, that yeah, that Pedersen one, yeah. You know, it's yeah. The there's Pedersen. so many things. There's so many things that have happened to him. Like, it's. Uh, but I think it was just the other week. I don't remember what game it was, but I remember watching the CBC package, and you're just like, man, like, how does this guy go through this much and not get a call, right? So, I, I think yeah. the offici- the officiating's been, you know, suspect this season. But then I think the other thing too is the Department of Player Safety has been so inconsistent. I, and see, I was just gonna say that it's like we're thinking the same thing right now. <laughs> the, the the officiating is maybe only you can only say the only thing worse than it would be the way that they've dished out suspensions and you know with with the cassian one okay sure i can see the seven games for that but there has been some missed a lot of calls that should have been resulting in a suspension that don't even get a fine or anything yeah i I find i find that it's been a little odd this year but um i i I suspect in the off season is that you're going to start to see a little bit of an overhaul and you're going to it's Really, at the end of the day, it depends on how the players feel about it, right? Because they're the ones that are going to be in charge of, you know, bringing it to the NHL and say, hey, we need to change this, right? There needs Because nobody knows what's suspendable and what's not suspendable anymore, right? And, like, you, you look and you see, like, uh, the, the Cassian where he goes after Kachuk. And I don't think a lot of us thought that was suspendable at all. And then suddenly, uh, out of nowhere, now it's suspendable. You know what? Then... If if you're going to suspend, not to sorry to cut you off, if you are going to suspend him for that, then you have to suspend Kachuk for the hit he laid on uh, Cassian earlier in the yeah. game because that was a predatory targeted hit. Yep. And so if, if you're going to suspend the one guy, you have to suspend them both. And then, you know, the, but then you put the shoe on the other foot, you see Cassian where he, uh, he you know, he puts his skate to Chernick's chest, you know, that's a clear suspension, right? And that's, even as an Oiler fan, like, that's... That's we what know I said. That it, that's it, we know it is. Right? Yeah. So... It's at least five games minimum, but because he's a repeat offender, I think that's what got him the two extra yeah. games. Yeah, but I the thought fact it would that, be at least four. I was like, it's going to be more... It's going to be at least four. And then anything do you remember... Yeah, and Connor got a two-game suspension last year for a hit to the head, which yeah. is... <laughs> which is ridiculous because it was a se- uh, had half a second to make a decision and he basically just got his hands up to protect himself and they called it a, a two game suspension. Yeah. Meanwhile, we've seen way more egregious things so, happen this year that weren't even fines. Yeah. So who was the guy the other week um, that had the ad hit? Um, I'm, oh, I'm blanking on it right now. Me it's, too. It's, I know like, what you're talking about. I think we're, we're recording the podcast right now. It's like uh, like almost eleven thirty on the West Coast here, and it was at twelve thirty for you because you're in the uh, you're in Mountain Time right now. Uh, no, it is one seventeen Saskatchewan <laughs> yeah, time right now. Oh, because you're Central Time, right? I'm Central Time, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's so, okay. I'm a night owl, so it works. Yeah, but we'll uh, yeah, no, it's it's just it's crazy. I'm sure, once again, this is a topic we could probably go on a long yeah. time on. Whoever, but whoever's listening can probably just uh, like, can message us on Twitter and let let us know which which incident that we're referring to. Where yeah, you know, it was a head hit that we automatically were just like, well, that was way worse than what McDavid did. But this guy's not getting anything. Like it was, exactly. And I think that's a good time to transition over into a little more McDavid talk, but on a more positive note. Uh, you know, you never want to see a guy get injured, especially a player as talented as McDavid, but he has a knack for scoring these beautiful goals in his first game back from injuries. I mean, you look in 2016 coming back from the clavicle injury when he scored the incredible one-on-three goal against Columbus. It's That's another one of those goals like the Marchant ones where we can all kind of picture it in our head. And to start this season, he scored that first goal of the year after the off-season knee surgery against the Canucks, and then tonight he gets another beauty against the Kings. Uh, what can you say about this guy in his way that he just seems to pop back from every injury and seemingly better than ever? I think it's just the fact that we're dealing with a player that's just as good as he is. Like This guy is just, you know, I think, I don't know, we're kind of turning this into a McDavid love fest, but... 
Uh, That's okay. <laughs> you know, just the, the way that this guy plays, like every night, is just he he's just so incredible. Just like getting those first three steps in to just create as much space. Like he's when he's on the ice, like he's he's controlling the play. The puck is in his hand, or, or it's just when he's got the puck, it's like something dangerous is about to happen, right? So you see it sometimes, like you know, when you watch him live and at the arena, and there are some plays where you know you you start to see him doing something. But the play just kind of falls apart. But it's one of those like few and far between things because more often than not, that play that he's getting, like you'll see, ah, it didn't really work on the first try, right? But it was it was subtle and not a, might not have noticed what he was doing. Then you see him in the next play and he and he nails the he nails the play and he maybe just missed the net by whoever he's passing it to just misses the net by a hair, right? But then by the third time he's done it, it's uh, you know it's it's in the back of the net, right? And he just does these things so quick, and it's it's a it's um it's really special to watch, right? Like we haven't had a player like this in Edmonton in what like when, when's the last time? Really, it was it was Gretzky and Messier, right? I mean, this skilled with the puck. That's it. Like you, you have to actually make the debate now: who is a better hockey player, Mark Messier or Connor McDavid? I mean, I think it, the 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 easy answer in terms of uh, legendary careers is Messier I, with all the cups and the greatness that he was a part of in the eighties. Connor's still very early in his career, but you might be able to say, yeah, he's in terms of pure hockey talent, he's a more talented player than, uh, than Messier. I don't, I don't think that's too sacrilegious, but Messier obviously is, you know, in Oilers lore forever. Like, I think at the end of the day, they will be, they will be the, the top three best Oilers of all time. will end up being Gretzky, Messier and McDavid in whichever order you want to put them. So. And you could end up having Drysidle pushing Yari Curry for the fourth spot. Yep, which is even crazier to think about. Even then, I think you mentioned that you wanted to talk about Nuge today too, and I did he's slowly working his way up too. And now, you know, that could be your top five in like ten years or no, ten years from now. If these guys can get a cup, because that's what they're missing, right? They, you've we can talk about how great these players are, and we can talk about how how awesome it is to watch them play, but. You know, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter if you don't win a cup. But I think these guys, like statistically, will will, will all end up in the top five exactly. the best Oilers of all time. I mean, Nuge could be the first Oiler to go end to end with the team, and I would love to see him start his career in Edmonton and finish his career there. And and like you said, who knows how how high Nuge goes up in terms of the greatest Oilers ever? It, and the other thing is, it let's say he spends, which 18... is crazy to think, like what you're it saying. It is. It's crazy to think is that. You know, the only ones had Gretzky, but he he wasn't a a, a bell to bell oiler. Messi no. wasn't a bell to bell oiler. Curry, Anderson, Ranford, Fear, like all these guys, even Coffee, right? They all, all played guys roughly were... half their careers. They they all played roughly the first half of their careers in Edmonton. Mm-hmm. But the the other thing is when you're ranking these guys, I mean, I have Paul Coffee probably right now as the fourth best oiler ever. I, I would say... He's the best would, defenseman they've ever had. Right. But then the thing is, Coffey only played seven years in Edmonton, won a Norris Trophy, three cups, set some records for most goals by a defenseman and things like that. So the, the tricky part will be come down the road. How do you compare that to, say, a guy like Nugent Hopkins who maybe spends 20 years with the Oilers? You know, seven years to 20 years, It's it, there's, a, there's a big gap there. Do you say, well, Coffey accomplished so much in a short period of time and Nuge didn't see that much success in the first nine, 10 years of his career, but Oh, you know, maybe in his thirties, the Oilers were winning cups. So that, that'll be the thing that we'll have debates 10, 15 years from now. Well, it's like the same thing that happened with Eisenman, right? Eisenman was a great player, played for Detroit, but he didn't win anything. And then all of a sudden, you know, they win a cup or two and now he's, you know, obviously one of the greatest players of all time, right? Yeah. I believe he was 32 when he got his first ring and he started at 18. So it, you know, it. Yeah, he was drafted in 83, right? So. Yeah. And he won it in 97. So yeah, it's, it, it doesn't happen overnight for all these players. Even, even Lemieux. I mean, we hear all the time about McDavid and, oh, you know, he hasn't had a bunch of success this early. I mean, look at what Lemieux did in the first five years of his career. Yep. Lemieux I think, suffered too. I think before they won the cup in 91, had he only made the playoffs once? I think he, I, I think he only made it once, twice at the most, right? But it was he had a tough go in Pittsburgh until they started to bring in some talent, until they got yeah. Yager, Francis, 
Uh, I don't know if Trache was there for both. Well, cups. he didn't have anybody to run with. Like, he didn't in he, his, exactly uh, early point of his career, and that's kind of what we're getting in with too with uh, with Connor now is that we've got a second line, but we still don't have a running mate for him on that top unit unless you yep. break up the the dry saddle line. Which exactly. Don't, I don't think anybody really wants to do that right now. No, and that's the thing. Maybe you'll have a guy like Raphael Lavoie who will fit in with Connor down the road. Maybe Tyler Benson will take another step and fill into that spot. Or maybe Ken Holland will have to go outside the organization and try and trade for one or sign one. But I think that it's great that we have that second line kind of set in stone. Now it's just a matter of, like you said, filling in around McDavid, which in theory doesn't sound like the most difficult job in the world because you've already got the main piece there. You've got this generational talent, this once in a lifetime player. The, the Oilers might never have a player in the, in their history again, who's as good as Connor. This might be as good as we ever see in our lifetimes. Yep. So I never saw Gretzky play with the Oilers. He was traded six months before I was born. So that, that eighties Oiler era, while I love it and, you know, we'll always go back on YouTube and watch it and read about it. That I, I didn't see any of that live, but I'm getting to witness Connor McDavid's career from the beginning. So it, it's such a special thing. And I think a lot of Oilers fans uh, from this generation feel the same way, but they do have to find the complimentary players to go with him. The He had Eberle, Maroon, guys like that for a while. Now they need to get back and find those guys again. Well, it's just like how, um, how the Canucks just had Sedins, right? They had the Sedins for for the better parts of two decades. And you, you kind of look back fondly at all those memories and you know, you, we're going to have a generation of kids that are going to be going through and, you know, they'll be pulling up YouTube in years from now, looking back and, you know, hearing the folklore stories about the Sedins and the, you know, the five overtime goals at the, the, the fifth overtime goal against Dallas in game one of the, what was it the, I think it was the 04 playoffs or no, it was the 03 playoffs maybe or, but, oh no, that was the 06, 06 playoffs. Yeah. The, that year. And just like, you know, you, you talk about all these little memories that we have with the Canucks and eventually, you know, these are going to be the things that we're going to talk about with the, with this group with like yeah. Connor and Leon, right? We, it's, it's how we we're now experiencing what, you know, uh, how the tables have turned, right? This, we're now listening to the stories of what, Everybody would tell us about, you know, seeing Gretzky, yeah. seeing seeing Messier, and now you know we get to see Connor, and we get to see uh, uh, we get to see Drysidle, and <laughs> you know Nugent Hopkins in that group, and it's it's Maybe. it's nice for each uh, each group of uh, each generation of Oilers fans to get something, right? <laughs> we'll be the boomers twenty years from now saying, uh, you know, this kid is good, but he wasn't but, as good as McDavid, you know. Yeah. Oh, he's he's nothing like that. Let me tell you about this new Jen Hopkins. Yeah, that's gonna be it's gonna be us down the road. He used uh, to skate so smooth and turn so fast <laughs> on his edges. I just I want to be able to talk about some cups too, and then and then they'll say, "Oh, you're living in the past," but at least it's a different past than the one we're currently talking about. <laughs> well, at least in my past, we used to make the playoffs. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm hoping I'm hoping my voice isn't going to go that that fast that soon. So I guess what we're saying is that in about 30 years, 30 40 years, the others are going to have another decade of darkness. Yeah, <laughs> you be here well, first. <laughs> you know what? Oh, I'll I'll take it if it means McDavid gets three cups in Edmonton. Let's let's say that. Um, but we'll I'll take it if we can just get one. I'm happy with one. Get yeah, me and one. you know what? That's, That's something for. that I talk to with a lot of guests. I, I say, it, is it? Is it acceptable if if the Oilers only win one cup with McDavid? And you know, I, it's not even on the podcast, but just with hockey fans in general that I talk to, and some Oilers fans will say, "Oh no, like, he has to win multiple cups." I mean, when you when you get a player like this, you can't waste that opportunity. And others will say, oh, "I mean, if he brings one cup to Edmonton, you know, that's more than we could ever have asked yeah. for." So, uh, I'm in the I'm in the mindset that if he wins one, it's fine. But I'd like to see more, obviously. We'd always like to see more, but yeah, you know, at at the end of the day, it's it's getting so it's you know it's not getting it is that much harder to win a Stanley Cup now. Like we're we're on we're on the verge of having thirty two teams in an NHL, 
we're no longer talking about a league that had six teams. We're not talking about a league that had 18. We're not talking about a league that had 21, 24, or 27. We're looking at a team or an NHL with 32 teams, and you can make the case for each of those 32 teams to win a Stanley Cup within a five-year window. You know, even, even the Kings. The Kings turn around and, you know, they sell, sell, sell now. They tear it down. They still got some pieces. They can turn things around in five years. They've got a good goalie coming up. They've got some defense prospects that will eventually be there. They've got some young forwards, right? You get a couple, another couple of stars in there, and boom, Kings are back on top. Like exactly. you can make a case for any team to to get there, right? It's just it's become so difficult to win now, right? That it's why I think that if you just if you can just win one, like look how long it took Ovechkin to win just one. Yeah. Like he's been years. was it thirteen years or so, right? And you know, you, even then, like you look like the St. Louis Blues have been around. Like you know, let's go back down memory lane, like those '90s teams. You know, you you lose in overtime to Eiserman and Detroit because Eiserman steps across the blue line and just wires one on a laser shot. You know, and that was a team that was deep enough that they could have gone somewhere because they had Gretzky, they had all, they had yep. a a very deep team that was, you know, everybody thought was a cup contender. You know, they're, they're out that year. And then you look in the early 2000s, they had that defense group that was built around McKinnis and Pronger. And they had, you know, the, the thing that sunk them was goaltending. They had Roman Turek in that. And then I feel like after that, like, you look at the Blues and where they've been, it took them this long to win their first Stanley Cup. Mm-hmm. You know, the Kings just won their first Stanley Cup in, what is it, 2012. And they'd been around for almost 40, years. 40, yeah, yeah, right? for, Cause it 40, was, what, 45 67? at the time. Yeah, because they've been in since 67, right? Yeah. yeah. They just celebrated their 50th a couple of years ago. So yeah, they, they'd they been around 45 years without a cup. The Blues went 52 years. I mean, there's look, a lot of these teams, right? And even now, like look at look at the uh, the Leafs, right? Like, yeah, fifty three. The the They're not winning the cup through, this year, so it's going to be fifty three. <laughs> but like they went through like some bad years in like the 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 seven. Like we'll we'll, we'll we're pretty much going to write off the seventies for the Leafs. The eighties for the Leafs were bad, but then nineties the they turned 93, around. 93, 93, They had Pop Fan, like they had uh, Gilmore. They had a deep team in ninety three. That was yeah. one win away. And one maybe Gretzky high stick away from going to the final <laughs> against Montreal. That's right? one of my favorite Gretzky moments too, is that he shut down the Leafs from going to the cup final in 93. And then look at the late nineties, right? Where it was like the late nineties, early two thousands when they had that team with like Cujo yep. and Sandin and Darcy Tucker, uh, you know, they were Cabriolet. They had a good defense. They had decent forwards. They had good goaltending. But they could, they just couldn't get over the hump because the league is just that good now, right? And and that's what it is, right? It's just, it's so hard to ju- to win just one, that like you just all you want to do is just win one, right? And right now with where the Pacific's going, is I know a lot of people look at the Oilers and say, you know what, they're just not deep enough. And 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 me honestly, the defense is good. It, it's it's probably their their brightest spot on their roster right now. Uh, the forwards, they've got speed. They play to the book. They, you know, they've, they've got a good system under Tippett. Everybody's buying in right now. But they're just, they're missing a couple of pieces up front. You know, they, there's no one to play yeah. with Connor right now. Right? You, you've got Cassie and that'll play with him when he's, once he's back. James Neal, when he's healthy, he'll, he'll be with him, right? But at 5-1-5, five five, you know, you, wanna, you want another running gun that'll play with him, right? And then... Uh, you look at the goaltending. Their goaltending's not it's not like a top ten goaltending group. It's that tandem is good. It's just not great. Right. Mm-hmm. But with where the Pacific is, you can make an argument about any of those teams and what weaknesses they have and how close it is that literally the Oilers could just go all the way to the to the Western final just because of coming out of the Pacific, it's an absolute crapshoot. Exactly. And I think that's one of the reasons why so many Oiler fans really want Holland to try and load up because you don't know how many chances you're going to get. And with the Pacific division being as wide open as it is, I believe that they can beat anyone in that division. And when you get to the conference final, you don't know who you're going to run into. Is it going to be Colorado or St. Louis or is one of the lower seeds going to come up and surprise someone? So you have a real chance to go to the conference final or farther this year. So 
you might as well give yourselves the best possible chance. And I understand Holland doesn't want to part with a first round pick unless it's for an established top six forward, but they that that kind of leads me into where I want to go next. The I think the last two discussions of the night will talk about their trade acquisition today and what we can expect from a Nugent Hopkins extension because I think both of you you and I are on page with uh, getting him locked up long term but uh, let's uh, let's just start with uh, Mike Green. You know, um I don't think there's anybody right now that you know they're I I think it's a safe move. It's a safe move that addresses a that addresses a weakness on the defense, right? Is the Oilers do have a very good power play unit, but you know, getting someone like Green will help uh, will help the power play. You know, he hasn't contributed that much this season. Now, how much of that is also just how poor the wings are, right? Uh, but you know, just kind of getting back into here, you know, the Green thing just kind of seems like it just came together this week, eh? Like. I think it was Kurt Levens that who's also like we have to give a shout out to Kurt. He's probably one of my favorite writers, and I love that he's from BC. Yeah, he's a really good writer. Um, yeah, he's one of like uh, I know that I stopped writing. So it's been over a year now, I think, and uh, like I might have taken a little break from that stuff. But, but one of the guys that I still read is, is Kurt's stuff like every week, and he's got this every Sunday. It comes out with the nine things, right? And he's one of the best writers that we have. But uh, I think he was the first one that said that. Uh, Green had like a 10 team no trade list and that was adjusted and uh, on February 1st right so what are the Oilers getting you know with the rings the wings are retaining 50% right so I guess the trade ends up being um, Green to the Oilers at 2.65 the wings end up eating 3.8 million and that's between Brodziak's 1.15 and the other 2.65 that they eat on green. So then, so that gets stayed with Detroit and then there's the conditional 2024. So that would be a 2021 third if the Oilers make the Western Finals and Green plays 50% of the games. Right? So, you know, that seems like a fair trade because like worst case scenario the Oilers are done, are one and done, right? You've essentially given up a fourth round pick this year, and you lose your third round pick probably because of the 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 Neil and Lucic uh, swap. But you still end up with your first, your second, and you've still got your later round picks, right? So the Oilers will still walk away with five assets, and that's without them trading away some of their minor league guys that just you know are at the end of the rope right now, right? Absolutely, but, uh, and. I think the Oilers would have loved to cut Mike Green, let's say five, ten years ago. But at the same time, I think that he can still be an effective player for him. And I, I'm just well, happy. Five, ten to years see ago, I think he was on everybody, every Oilers fan's uh, NHL video game uh, dynasty mode. It was like one of the top oh, four defensemen. Absolutely. Yeah. And you know, I I grew up in Saskatoon, right? So I watched him play for the Blades, and. Uh, I can remember seeing him back in elementary school and high school. So that that's kind of cool to always see a blade player make it to the Oilers. And just even when they go anywhere, like even Kirby Doc in, in Chicago, he's an Edmonton area kid too. It's great to see him make it. And, uh, you know, I kind of track those players throughout their NHL careers. But, yeah, he's, he's a guy who I think would uh, be a good addition to the team. And uh, maybe not the Detroit target that everyone wanted. I think that uh, Athanasiu was the, was the one who Oilers fans, or most Oilers fans anyway, were hoping was going to be coming when Gene Principe announced that breaking news uh, mid-game. I think the last time the Oilers actually did a mid-game trade announcement was when Dayarnay was uh, acquired back in 2017. But... Yeah, it was uh, it was kind of interesting to get that news in the middle of the game, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Um, you know, kind of looking at where where we see Green. You know, like at this stage of the game, I don't think anybody is expecting him to be a bona fide like come in here and just start you know filling in for Clefbaum being gone or any of that. I think that those days are gone. But you know, injuries have been taking a toll on him. Uh, he missed six games in January. I think this year he's played like 48 of 64, I think. So he's missed like 16 games so far. Uh, you know, he's had some personal problems. He's had some upper body injuries, some shoulder problems or whatnot, I believe. Uh, but, you know, uh, one of the takeaways that I have here is he's still playing top, like he was still playing top four minutes in Detroit. Like he was still playing like 21 plus a night. Um, 
And then even since he's come back in the last 10 games, he's been playing 21, 22, 23 minutes a night. Uh, he's still one of the wings top three D that they're using on the power play. Um, I know that only four of only four of his 14 points. So I think he's got a, so it was four of the 11 points that he has right now are from the power play. Right. So, you know, the Detroit power play has been absolutely anemic. Right. So you look at some of the stats uh, of where it is, and it is, you have to take into fact that Detroit's been so bad this year, right. That, if he was on a better team that could click a little bit better on the, on special teams that maybe his numbers would be a little bit better. Maybe we might be talking about like a, like a 20 point defenseman, which, you know, for the Oilers is it, it's a good addition, right? Like, you know, uh, you've now got a right side that's got bear Larson green and Benning, you know? So one of those guys ends up having to shuffle over to the other side, and then, you know, and when you're healthy on the left side, you got cleft bomb nurse, Jones, Russell and Lajeson. So, you, you know, you, you've got that depth there. You've got eight guys that can play. Oh, for sure. And not to put you on the spot here again, but i love to get your uh, take on it. Um, top four Oilers D to start the 2020-2021 season. Uh, so for next season, eh? Yeah. Oof. You know, I think, uh, what is it? Your Clef Bomb will be back. Nurse will be back. Um, I think that they find a way to weasel... Uh, so Bear will be back for sure, and then it's just a, it's a it's a decision on what they want to do with Larson. Is if uh, Larson gets a reduced role and bumps down, or if because one of him or Russell is going to go this off season, right? I, I, Hopefully Russell. Like we, I I think it might like I'm hoping that it would be Russell because he's already playing in that bottom six, right? And you know I don't. I could see a situation where they end up losing Russell and then Larson the the subsequent summer, right? Uh, but uh, you know, it's hard to it's hard to see Bouchard not getting a shot in the top four at least, you know, to to play on the power play as well, right? Because no. I think we're all I think we're in agreement that that Green's a <laughs> Green's a gonna be like third pairing defenseman once he's here, and he's only he's just gonna be a rental anyways, right? Yeah. So the, the other thing, I'd like oh, sorry, Bouchard go ahead. there. It's either going to be, it's going to be those three with either Bouchard or Larson. And I think that if they end up doing a Larson trade that in the summer to fetch them that top six guy, and then shuffle out Lar, uh, shuffle out Russell, then you'll because I think that was personally what I would do is try to trade Larson in the summer to get that top six forward, that guy that's going to be uh, McDavid shotgun. And then you trade Russell as well for the cap relief, and uh, you end up getting into one of those spots where then you've now created a hole for Bouchard to slide in, and you got Bouchard and Bear on the right side in your top four, with Clefbaum and Nurse on the le- on the left side. No, that's an interesting take. And for me, I can see a scenario where Bouchard starts on the third pairing as a rookie, but plays the point on the power play. So they're really going to try to specialize his skill set to maximize his potential. That's just that's just where I think that they'll see him because they realize that he's such a good distributor of the puck and he's got that cannon for a shot, which the Oilers currently don't have. Uh, and that would add well, such a dimension to their power play. So I, I think I think that they could really, really have a, a weapon there. Well, doesn't um, Bouchard kind of remind you of Mike Green? Like when uh, Mike Green was coming up through his early years in Washington? Kind of. I, I think Similar the, skill set. I think the player he got compared to at the draft was um, John Carlson. Now, who knows if he comes anywhere close to that, but if he can be even 80% of what John Carlson is, then the Oilers did really well with that pick. Yeah. And I'm well, a Bouchard fan as it is, so I'm hoping that that will come to fruition. Uh, I guess the last topic I want to discuss with you, I I talked about it on the last podcast a little bit too, but, you know, with Nugent Hopkins continuing to move up the Oilers' record books, he tied Everly for ninth in Oilers' goals tonight with 165. Uh, He's the longest-serving player on the team. What kind of contract would you be comfortable with or maybe that you think he'll get in the offseason from Edmonton? I think he, well, he'll get one with a no move clause. I, I think that's guaranteed. But um, but we're agreed. You, you before look, you go, on, they do have to lock him up this summer, right? You don't risk going into the season with him facing down UFA status. 
No, I, I think that they will. They'll find a way to lock him up, especially if they have yeah. a. If, if they if you can win a round in the playoffs this year, and get in the second round, at least you got to show him. Show him that like, hey, like we're we're headed in the right direction. We're getting there. Like we've had some bad years, and you've suffered through a lot, but we're we're getting there. Oh, he suffered more than anyone, and I think, and we always hear, you know, they got to keep Connor happy. They got to keep him in Edmonton. They got to keep Leon happy. We got to keep Nuge happy too. I mean, this guy has been through so much crap, and he's still so loyal to this team so yeah it's uh, I, I think that they really have to lock him up and i, I believe they will this summer but uh what, what do you see on the contract um it's tough to say right with uh, with what's going on um you know, it, it's, it's how you see him being utilized in the next coming years right like, like um is he gonna is he gonna stay on the wing uh, you know or do you gonna move him back to center or, or how do you want to utilize him but you know like he could be anywhere from six to seven million. An extension is kind of what I'm imagining. Six to seven million times six years. That's kind of what I suspect would happen with a no move clause. Okay. I think that's. I think that's going to be. That's going to be the ticket. Like I don't think it's going to cost you anything more than that because like he's not the like he's not he's a building piece, but he's not the focal point of where Connor and Leon are. Right. Those are the two anchor po- anchor points on the roster. Nuge is a. Is you know he, he's your complimentary guy uh, within that group. Yeah, like I can see him going forward. Like, who knows how good some of their prospects will turn out to be? You know, maybe Lavoie turns into a thirty goal scorer. Uh, maybe Broberg establishes himself as a top pairing defenseman. So Nuge could be the fifth best player on that team somewhere down the line. But I would sign him for eight years times seven and a half million per in a heartbeat. I, I'd do that deal tomorrow if he would sign it. Yep. Yep. I, I think that like I think a six to seven is probably fair. Um, because you, you have to start looking at when who because the guys that are making just a shade over seven and a half, you know, like that's like that's like cause that's off territory. And we used to try to say that you know, is Nuge as impactful as like a Evgeny Kuznetsov? Like, I don't, I don't think so. No, uh, I don't think so either. But with the contracts continuing to rise, and I know his agent will say, well, the salary cap's going to continue to go up too. So there's, uh, I just don't envision them signing him for under seven million. If you could get him for seven million, then that's that's great. Lock him up right now if he agrees to that. Yeah, because. <sighs> I think I think I just just think it's like tough to say, right? Like, well, he's a two way guy, but what what do you see? Like, what, what kind of seasons do you think he's going to have for the next three or four years when the Oilers are really pushing for cups? Like, do you see him as like a sixty five point guy playing with Drysaitel and Yamamoto, or or where, where do you see him? Yeah, like I kind of see him around there, like that sixty to seventy, uh, like that sixty to seventy range is like in his prime years is, is what I think he's going to be here. But I think that we're also paying for his. Where he is right now is, I think we're in his prime years right now, right? So, like, if we oh, start yeah. going too long is that we're going to be starting to get out of those. But um, I don't see know, him I, dropping I off too much. Like, to see like his... like, I think, seven, I think like, anywhere from six to seven would be prime. And yeah. if, you're, if you're looking at, like, uh, cost inflation and whatnot, uh, you know, then, then maybe he ends up being on the higher side and gets you to seven, right? But you look at some of the guys that are – that are around there, right? Like, I think he's comparable to what, um, you know, like what Pacioretty's doing, right? Like, Pacioretty's a 30 30 guy, right? And then, where, where's Nuge this year, right? Like, <laughs> Nuge is. Nuge is that's what I was hoping Yakupov would be back in the day. I thought, you know, yeah. if Yakupov can be a 30 goal, 30 assist guy, that's perfect. Yeah. But <laughs> it didn't quite happen. Anyway, uh, Nuge, like you said, um, I, I still think the goals will be a little less than the assists so we, we i yeah, i see he's, him maybe... he's not a goal scorer i think we can agree on that he's got a great shot though like that's the thing he's not a natural shooter but he can rip it when he decides to like that that quick little snapper he's got he he scores a lot of goals from the high slot there i i, I see him as like a 25 goal 40 assist guy yeah i think that's fair that's kind of where i was going i would see him around the 20 to 25 goals and I think that one year, last year, when he was playing with uh, Connor for that long stretch, you know, where he was like close to thirty, I think that was a little bit, you know, uh, a little bit on the higher side of what I was expecting. But you know, twenty to twenty-five is is a safe number for what I would suspect that you can get out of him, right? But I'm just kind of I'm creeping on here on Puckpedia to see. So, who's the other guys that his agents got? So his agents also got uh, got DeBrusque. 
And he's okay. got, he needs got, a new contract, right? Yeah. And then uh, he got Ryan Murray signed. And uh, I think Ryan Murray's up for a deal this year, isn't he? Yeah, I think uh, Ryan I'm not up sure. For a deal I know DeBrus needs a new deal. I'm not sure about Murray. Yeah. But he doesn't really have any other real star star guys, right? So not a whole lot of pull where he's got where he's one of the bigger agents. Uh, um, but uh, I, I personally feel, as I say, if I run the comparables on him, I think that's six to seven million. Like anything like under six and a half is a steal. So maybe I'll, he's maybe already I'll, making I'll six though, down. right? So I'll, I'll pinch it down to about six and a half to seven million is kind of where I think that we'll do end up getting them done for. And I think it'll probably be around six years or so. And that gets him to 32 and that he will still be able to at 32, be able to get another big, big yeah. deal at that point. Right. So, well, okay. So his, he turns 27 in, uh, in April and his contract ends when he's 28 so the next contract actually starts at 28 okay so then we're getting them down to 34 so i i before. think that that's fair because then okay. that gets him all the way down before he becomes like a that gets him that covers his prime years the last two years before he starts to taper off and after that then he can get one of those over 35 contracts if he wants to continue to stick around or continue playing or at whatever level that he's at right and then that would probably be around the same same dollar signs that you get. And I don't think you're be expecting him to get like eight or nine million at the end of that once he's thirty five. So I, I personally think that six and a half to seven million is kind of like the prime number. If it goes yeah. if it goes plus or minus, you know, like uh, like a couple thousand dollars, like oh, it's not the end of the world. But uh, long, you know, like long story short, though, it's he's a he's a he's a piece that they need to sign. He's a piece that's going to be a part of the solution. And uh, I think we both agree that they need to get something done this summer. Yeah. Put a no move Absolutely. clause on it to, to, you know, to give them some added security and, you know, some knowing that, you know, they're not planning to move them and they're not planning to, to end the relationship early at all. But, uh, you know, I, I feel that six and a half to seven million is what I'll narrow down on uh, on a six year deal with a no move clause. Bring that into them in the summer and, and hopefully that gets it done. Definitely. And, you know, uh, I hope that I can have you back on sometime, whether it be during the playoffs or in the summer to kind of talk about more about this, because I feel like we could go for three hours, but I think we'll, we'll wrap it up here for tonight. So uh, before I say uh, goodbye, I just want to say, is there anywhere that you want to, is anything you want to plug or do you have a, a Twitter account that people can follow you if they're just checking on the website and they don't already follow you? Um, yeah, just, um, you know my uh, my Twitter account is uh, Sander EDM, um, and you like I tweet whenever I really feel like it. I, after I stopped writing, I just kind of just I, I I found that I was on Twitter way too much, and I was just buried into all the stats and just taking a bit of a social media at, break, uh, and just kind of just getting into things is way too much. And so actually stepping back now is like I, I'm still involved I still tweet pretty often but mm -hmm. I'm not as uh, I'm not as to the point where I've literally read like you know for all the main guys that would cover the Oilers like I, I would know all their tweets I would know what they were talking about and then I'm, you know you have to go into all the prospects and whatnot and so I've taken a little bit of a break from all that stuff so I still follow things uh, but just not as closely as I used to for sure and, uh you know, but maybe you know, and once uh, life slows down a little bit, maybe I'll uh, maybe I'll start to get back into the into the chair yeah. and start writing again. Well, you were one of my favorite writers, and I'll always appreciate you for bringing me over to the hockey writers and giving me a chance to uh, work there. And um, yeah, just I I hope everything's going good for you, and it's it's always a lot of fun chatting with you. So much much appreciated doing this tonight, and uh, let's do this again soon. I hope. Yeah, I hope so we can do it again soon. Thanks for having me again. Yeah, it's awesome. Okay, so for Shane Sander, I'm Eric Friesen. This has been the 99 Forever Podcast. We're out.